Bacteria and other pathogens constantly enter your bloodstream. From sites of infection, injuries, the mucous membranes, and even while you brush your teeth. Bacteria are a danger. A danger to the inner lining of the heart, the endocardium, and the heart valves. They can cause destruction, abscess, perforation, heart failure, uncontrolled infection, and eventually death. A very dramatic introduction indeed, but it is a very dramatic disease which carries a very high mortality. The good thing for you, for someone who learns to diagnose endocarditis, this time it's not about learning facts, it's more about looking at images to see the different variations, facets and faces of endocarditis, not only with respect to the images itself, but also in respect to the clinical presentation. And I remember a patient who presented with confusion and was admitted to psychiatry. Another patient who had acute abdominal symptoms and nearly underwent appendicitis surgery before we found out he actually had endocarditis. And then there was the patient who had dysphagia as a lead symptom and who was on the gastroenterology ward for over 14 days before we found out he had a completely different diagnosis. And I still vividly remember a patient who had severe back pain simply because he embolized into the spinal cord from endocarditis. And in the literature, even symptoms such as splenic laceration and bicortical blindness have been reported. So the key things to remember are, patients do not necessarily have to have fever. Sometimes they only present with night sweats. Sometimes the lead symptoms are related to complications of endocarditis. And if we have heart failure in the setting of fever, it could be indicative of endocarditis. And of course, if we have a murmur in the setting of fever, this could also point in the direction of endocarditis. But then again, unfortunately, nobody uses the stethoscope anymore. But before we see echo images of endocarditis, I want to say a few words about the pathophysiology of endocarditis and also about the incidence, how frequently it occurs, so that you get a better feel for the magnitude of the problem. In addition, I want to talk about the mortality and then also on how echocardiography can help us to diagnose this disease. The true definition of endocarditis is an endovascular microbial infection of cardiovascular structures. So it can affect not only the valves, but also the endocardium of the atria and the ventricles, even the large intrathoracical vessels, and in particular also prosthetic material, such as polymer associated structures and prosthetic heart valves. It's quite difficult to really determine the true incidence of endocarditis, and it also seems to vary from country to country. But in the literature, we find an incidence somewhere between 1.9 to 6.2 annual infections per 100,000 population. This translates into approximately 15,000 cases of endocarditis in the United States. The incidence also seems to increase with age. And it is also more frequent in the male versus the female population by a ratio of approximately 3 to 1 to 6 to 1. Before I go on, I would like to say a few words about the pathophysiology of endocarditis. By the way, what does this image, which should resemble, I guess, some kind of a planet, have to do with the pathophysiology of a disease like endocarditis? Well, those craters here. Those craters resemble some form of damage. And a damage is also at the beginning of the cascade, which eventually leads to endocarditis. A damage of the endothelium. There are several different reasons why the endothelium can be injured. It can be injured because of mechanical stress, for example, because we have high velocity jets which kind of destroy or erode the surface of the endothelium, for example, in patients who have a ventricle septal defect or some other form of regurgitation. It can be caused by catheters, in other words, iatrogenic, by toxic agents, in particular in patients who are IV drug abusers. We'll talk about the importance later when we talk about 
right heart endocarditis, but also because of immunologic factors. Whatever the cause for the injury is, the body tries to repair the defect, and so he activates all these different substances such as cytokines, integrins, tissue factor, and what else not. And then we have fibronectin, monocytes, and platelets come in, and thrombus formation, which kind of seals off or tries to repair this defect. So at the beginning of the cascade, we have an injury and a thrombus formation. In most cases, this is probably it. The patient doesn't get endocarditis. The endocardium is healed, maybe a bit thickened, aged, as one could say, but certainly the patient does not have endocarditis. But if we have bacteremia at the same time, if bacteria are in the bloodstream, they can superinfect this thrombus and then start a whole new cascade which leads to what we call formation of a vegetation. Such vegetations are composed of red blood cells, of infected material, leukocytes, platelets, fibrin, and many other substances. And the problem is that this vegetation has a tendency to grow because this cascade is not stopped. And we have ongoing infection in the region of the endothelium and more and more damage. This diagram looks awfully complicated at the first glance, but in reality it's not. And we saw parts of it already. Here we have the endothelial damage. Here we have the thrombus formation, superinfection, and the vegetation. With this diagram, I want to show you what else can happen and what the sequels are. Let's start here. We said already we have a thrombus formation and a repair process. As already mentioned, in most cases, we will have sealing and healing of the defect and all we have left is maybe just a little sclerotic area within the region of the endocardium. If we go on here, if infection is uncontrolled, it expands and damages more and more of the endothelium and causes severe complications. Such vegetations can grow and eventually they can embolize, either in form of large emboli, which cause, for example, septic stroke, or microemboli, which for example cause Janeway lesions, hemorrhagic lesions on the soles and the palms. If somehow the infection is stopped, usually with the help of antibiotics, we have some form of residual lesion or defect, either an old vegetation which is echogenic and which is calcified or fibrotic, or we also have some residual damage to the entire endocardium, here in this example a defect. So keep in mind, we have the first part of the whole process, which is the endocardial defect. Then we have the active infection. Then we can have embolism or a residual phase, which we call post-endocarditis. So the hallmark of endocarditis is the vegetation. And here's an example of vegetation seen on an aortic bioprosthetic valve in a patient who is being operated. We can see not only one vegetation, but multiple vegetations on the valve. And this is how a vegetation would be seen with the help of echocardiography. Again, an aortic valve, and we have a mobile structure on the valve, which moves back and forth between the aorta and the LVOT. Also note that the structure is jelly-like and has a soft appearance, a sign that it is fresh endocarditis. There are several ways of classifying endocarditis, either as definite, suspected, or possible, depending on how sure you are that there really is endocarditis, as active or non-active, depending on the degree of infection, native, prosthetic, or in IV drug abusers, depending on what is affected, the native valve or the prosthetic valve, culture positive, or negative, nosocomial or community acquired, and finally bacterial or fungal. Here's some data from our institution which clearly shows we now have staphylococcal aureus infection as the most common pathogen which causes endocarditis. And similar results have also been published from other institutions.
The problem is that staphylococcal infection is a very serious form of infection because it always causes or very frequently causes a valvular destruction, abscess formation, and complications of endocarditis. So keep in mind, approximately 30% of endocarditis is caused by staph infection, often associated with nosocomial infection. Staph infection is on the rise and, as already mentioned, a very aggressive pathogen, a truly ugly bug. Yeah. This is a really interesting graph. It shows you the mortality of endocarditis with respect to the various decades. You can nicely see that endocarditis was practically a lethal infection or lethal disease before the advent of penicillin. Then the mortality dropped. Another drop was found after the advent of microbial diagnostics surgical intervention, and then we have echocardiography, which also greatly impact the prognosis of endocarditis, both transthoracic echo and transesophageal echocardiography. So echocardiography greatly impacted also the treatment of endocarditis because for the first time it was possible to directly visualize the infection, not post-mortem, but pre-mortem not only see the indirect signs of endocarditis with the help of auscultation, but to really see and visualize the infection. And early diagnosis is the key to successful treatment of endocarditis. You will see that over and over again. And yes, other imaging modalities such as MRI or CT can also at least sometimes visualize vegetations, but they have a number of disadvantages. They're not as available at the bedside as echo, the frame rates are not comparable and we need high frame rates because those vegetations often move very quickly. And finally, the image resolution is also not comparable to that of echocardiography. But here is an example of a CT where we nicely see vegetations on the aortic valve. I already mentioned the fact that time to diagnosis is crucial for the prognosis of the patient. And therefore, it's very important to refer the patients early to echocardiography. However, in reality, this is not always done. Why? Well, I mentioned that way at the beginning of this chapter, because the symptoms are sometimes so difficult to interpret. Here's data from two studies that highlights the problem. In a study reported in 2009 in the Archives of Internal Medicine, the diagnosis of endocarditis was made only 30 days after the onset of symptoms in 23% of patients. And even inside the hospital, even after the patient has been admitted, there's often a delay until echocardiography is being performed. This is from the Piemont Infective Endocarditis Study Group published in 2004. The delay here was a mean of 8.2 days within the hospital. So the key message here is think about endocarditis and suspect endocarditis and refer the patient to echocardiography as early as possible. And how high is the mortality of endocarditis once the diagnosis has been made? Well, it obviously depends on many factors. Not all patients who have endocarditis are the same. But patients who have paravalvular complications, who have staph infection, and who already have signs of pulmonary congestion such as pulmonary edema have a worse prognosis. This is also true for patients who have mitral valve vegetations, who have prosthetic valve, and who are older. And who are the patients who get endocarditis in the first place? What are the predisposing factors? First of all, patients who have mitral valve prolapse with and without MR don't have such an elevated risk of endocarditis, especially not if MR is only mild and if the mitral valve morphology is normal. Patients with mitral stenosis have a higher risk, and an even higher risk is found for patients who have aortic stenosis, and a very or fairly high risk is found in patients who have prosthetic valves. We talked about that problem already in the chapter on prosthetic valves. Both patients with mechanical and biological valves have an elevated risk, and patients who have combined aortic valve replacement and mitral valve replacement have the highest risk of all. The list of predisposing factors for endocarditis is certainly not complete. One should also mention ventricular septal defects, which have an elevated risk. 
however not the atrial septal defects, patent duct, and even mitral annular calcification. And finally, here is a list of non-cardiac risk factors for endocarditis. Dental procedures, surgery, trauma, alimentation catheters, intravenous drug abuse, and patients who are immune compromised, for example, HIV patients. You will also find this list and the indications for endocarditis prophylaxis in your fact sheets. And now to the question, which valve is actually involved? Well, both the aortic and the mitral valve, of course. At least in our institution, we have more patients who have aortic valve endocarditis opposed to mitral valve endocarditis. But what is interesting is, we have a large proportion of patients who have endocarditis of prosthetic material. Aortic valve prosthesis, mitral valve prosthesis, and pacemakers. And how does transthoracic echocardiography compare to transesophageal echo? Well, if you look at the literature, TE is obviously superior. We have a very high sensitivity and specificity for TE, which is not as good for the transthoracic approach. In reality, however, and with improvements in 2D imaging and transthoracic imaging, the gap between TE and transthoracic echo is probably not as big as it seems here from this diagram. In many patients, you will be able to make the diagnosis with transthoracic echo. Where transthoracic echo is truly inferior is in the setting of prosthetic valves. We talked about that issue already in the appropriate chapter. And so, when would we perform transesophageal echocardiography? Well, actually always. Both if we suspect endocarditis, but also if we already made the definite diagnosis with transthoracic echo. Simply because, with the help of TE, we can detect complications. So in conclusion, what should you remember from this chapter? Well, first of all, that endocarditis can manifest itself in very many different ways. Second, it is a fairly infrequent disease, but it carries a very high mortality once you have it. Third, echocardiography plays a central role in the diagnosis, and you should make the diagnosis as early as possible. Fourth, think of endocarditis as a superinfected thrombus. Fifth, the most common pathogens are staphylococcal and streptal infection. And finally, number six, don't forget that prosthetic material predisposes to the development of endocarditis.